Peter says, if you open to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, he specifically says, since everything's going to dissolve when Jesus Christ returns, how should we live now? Since everything is going to dissolve when Jesus Christ returns as king, how should we live now? That's why we're studying 2 Peter 3 before we go into the dissolving. Because really, the Lord's going to dissolve the earth. He's going to overwhelm the medical system when plagues run rampant. He's going to overwhelm the power grid when all the lights go off. He's going to overwhelm everything at his return. But he's going to do that because it's already been written and it's going to happen. Peter said, since everything's going to dissolve, verse 11 of 2 Peter 3, how should we live today? Did you know we gather... Because we believe that Jesus Christ, and we're going to celebrate his resurrection in a couple weeks, we believe he's real, he's alive, that he has spoken, and that what he says has has a direct impact on today in our lives. We say that we're his followers. And so Peter speaks one of the most timely messages, and we're going to actually look at, at the whole overview of all 18 verses and see even a repeated word that he uses. But what Peter says is, since all of Revelation 6 onward is going to happen, should you live any differently today? And, and really, the response is at communion at the end of the service this morning. Communion ought to be a time where we say, Lord, everything is going to be dissolved. And Lord, you've told me how you want me to live here. And I want what I know to start lining up with what I do. And that's, that's why we gather every time. But let, let's look at 2 Peter 3. Every day, each of us makes a big choice. Every day we choose which master we're going to follow. Now, if I just surveyed, if we had a, a roving mic, I bet every person that calls himself a Christian here this morning, if we took a microphone to you, you'd say, yes, the Lord is my master. Yes, Jesus is my master. I mean, we would never deny that. But it's not about what we say because with our mouth, most believers would really say that Christ is their master. It's each day that we point to our master by our choices. Now, over the last 168 hours, we could do a time analysis and see who's your master. It's the person you devoted the prime time in your life to. You know what they call, they used to, I don't even know what they call it now, but they used to call a certain hour of the evening prime time because they were registering how many millions of Americans were on their televisions then. But now, because of, I mean, not only Hulu and company, but because of the internet and the devices, I think prime time is all the time. I think everybody is kind of uh, checking something all the time. But who you give your true prime time to is your master. And if it's Personal enjoyment, that's what your master is, your flesh. If it's the finances, if it's the pursuits, if it's, if it's just playing games or, or being, you know, amused, that's what's mastering you. Peter said every day, by our choices, by our time investments, with our motivations that drive our handling of money, these are the actions that speak louder than our words. These are the choices the little ones, incrementally, that really show who our master is. So what Peter is saying is, I settled that a long time ago. In fact, both of his epistles, he keeps going back to what happened to him as a young man when he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus called Peter with two words. This past July, I, we, we regularly, each year, we take people to Bethsaida, where, in Israel, by the Sea of Galilee, where Peter is from, where he lived. And we always read the two-word call Jesus gave him. Follow me. And it says he dropped his nets and followed Christ. Jesus was his master. Your master you follow. You respond to. You obey. Well, as we turn again to 2 Peter 3, we see what Peter heard way back then. Around the Sea of Galilee and the other disciples And what they heard Jesus say is, nobody can serve two masters. Your masters, there there are two choices every day. We serve the Lord or we serve something else. You can't do both. Jesus said they're mutually exclusive. No one can serve two masters. Either love the one and despise the other. You hold to the one and 
and reject the other. You can't have both, Jesus said. And so, right there at the start of his ministry, Jesus came right to the point. He told Peter, you've got to be choosing which master you'll follow. And you know, this morning, we need to be choosing which master we'll follow. That's what this whole passage is about. This whole passage is since the Lord's already told us how everything's going to be dissolved, how are you supposed to live today? Don't worry about how he's going to dissolve it. He's going to do it. In fact, it was interesting. I was, my son goes to an early Bible study and he was prepping for it and we were up early and he was talking to me and he says, Dad, he says, does it matter that I still have trouble understanding parts of Isaiah? And I said, honey, or well, he's too big to call him honey. I said, young man. Uh, actually, did probably call him honey. Oh, I, I come to think of it, I shouldn't do that because he's big. But I said, did you know that Peter said that he had trouble understanding what Paul wrote? You understand that? None of us perfectly understand all the scripture, but the parts we do understand, we should obey and respond to. And so this morning, we should be choosing which master we'll follow. And we have a choice of masters, and only one can be served. And Peter says, I'm going to hold on to that master that called me to follow him all my days. And so 2 Peter 3, Peter exhorts them. What I want you to see, we're going to actually look at all 18 verses, but I want you to see one word that Peter repeats five times. Now, you know what? If someone repeats something over and over again, either they're trying to emphasize it or they're forgetful, okay? And, uh, you know, I regularly, I, I, all the different groups, you know, the staff, and when I'm with the pastors and when I'm with the elders, I say, I don't know, did I already tell you this story? You know, because I know that I probably repeat them. But Peter's not forgetful. Five times. He uses the very same word. And you can see it. In fact, this morning, if you want to do something interesting, you ought to circle it. Because it will remind you of the tone that Peter challenges. Peter doesn't come in and read him the riot act and yell at him and say, you guys, get your act together. You need to be living differently. What he says is, beloved. 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 Five times in one little chapter. Do you think he meant it? Do you think he was emphasizing? Yes, that's the tone. What he's saying is, Jesus loved us so much, we should respond. In fact, that's the reason for obedience. We respond in obedience to Christ because we love him. Because he is beloved of our heart. And Peter said, because of that, you should obey. So 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 1, let's all stand, and you just follow along in your Bibles. I'm going to show you this word study, and then we're going to dig into it this morning. And I want you to see the tone and have that jump off the page so that as you hear his exhortation, you catch the flavor. It's very gentle. Verse 1. That's the first beloved, by the way. Beloved, number one. I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the command of us, the apostles of our Lord Jesus. He says, beloved, Be mindful of the word of God. Second one, look at verse 8. But beloved, number 2, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now look down at verse 14, beloved number 3. Therefore, beloved... Looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Verse 15, as the next beloved. Consider the long suffering of our Lord as salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. And by the way, in verse 16, he says, and what he says is hard to understand. But listen to him beloved. And finally, here's what we're looking at this morning, verse 17, the fifth beloved. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware. I love you so much. Beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Verse 18, but grow in the grace of and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory 
both now and forever. Amen. Wow. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, I pray that we would catch the tone of Peter. He's your servant. You got his attention as a young man. And he never stopped wanting to follow you. He failed you miserably, publicly, cussed and swore and denied you and everything else. But he loved you so much. And you restored him as you always do, your children. And he, he wrote this letter to say that no failure is too, too dark, too deep, too permanent with Christ because he's a God of new beginnings. And he is the God of the second and the third and the millionth chance. And so because we're all immersed in, in this world that seeped with materialism, we're going to, from time to time, fall from our steadfast devotion to you. But Peter didn't rebuke him. He just said, beloved, be careful. Beware of this. Grow more and more aware of it. Grow more and more responsive to saying no to the error of the wicked that permeates our world. And I pray we'd catch that tone and, and, and follow his example and let your grace by your spirit Change us a little more today. In the name of Jesus, we're asking for that. Amen. You may be seated as you're seated. Number one, verse 17, beware is our challenge. I mean, Peter said it. He said, beware. I love you so much. I'm telling you, beware. Beware of, of the evil. You know, materialism. Materialism is... is thinking of things more than honoring their creator. Materialism is seeing things more clearly than we see the, the creator of those things. Materialism is, is honoring and sacrificing for and, and, and living for things rather than the one who allows us to have them. Materialism is constantly a temptation around us. It drives our world. It's the motivator for most people. The acquisition of more stuff and, and power and prestige and position and pleasure, that's just what people live for. But Peter loved his brothers and sisters so much, he warned them. He says, beware. And by the way, the word translated beware means be constantly guarding yourself. It makes me think of Honduras uh, last week. I mean, once Bonnie whapped that first uh, scorpion three times to kill it, I realized the little things are armored. You know, they're like an armored personnel carrier. And, and I saw that little pointy thing, you know, it's just ready to go at any moment. Boy, I just wore my flashlight out. Anytime it was dark, I was looking for, you know, any of those little pests. And then she found another one and killed it. And I mean, I just was just looking everywhere because I was constantly on guard. You know what Peter said? He says, be constantly guarding yourself. Paul already said, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Peter says, I'm never going to think I'm standing. I'm going to be constantly guarding myself. True believers, by the way, can't fall from being saved. Notice what it says in verse 17. Beware lest you also fall. Fall from what? We can't fall from salvation, but we can fall from being solidly living out what we say we believe. Remember we started with, everybody would say, oh, Jesus is my master. If Jesus is my master, money is not. My career is not. Uh, living for more stuff is not. Did you know once you come to that point, your life is altered. It's a new paradigm. You measure things differently. When, when they say, hey, do you want to work triple overtime? I mean, my dad used to get that all the time. He worked at Ozenville for 46 years. And they come in and they say, we're giving double time. He says, not interested. They say, well, we're going to give this and we're going to give that. And we're going to give that. And he says, I'm not interested. I'm not going to work on Sunday. It's the only day I get to see my family and honor my Lord. And they said, but come on, you know, if you work change over triple time or whatever, you can buy a boat. He says, yeah, but you can never get back what you lose. When you're not materialistic, you measure life differently. You can't buy with money what belongs to the Lord. Our responsibilities to him, to our family, to his church. That can't be taken away from me for money. It's interesting to, to think how, how true believers can, can not be solidly living out what they profess. That Jesus is my master, he runs my life, he's more important than anything else, but yet it doesn't show up in their decisions. 
And Peter says, don't fall from your steadfastness. Steadfastness is when we say and we do what God's word says and they line up. What we say we believe and what we do lines up with what God said. That's being steadfast. That's sticking to what the Lord asks us to do. Well, what are we supposed to beware of? Beware of falling from steadfastness, verse 17 says. What is steadfastness? I mean, you know what I love about the Bible? Anything the Bible brings up, the Bible defines. And this word just doesn't drop out of the air here in, in verse 17. Look back at chapter 1. In, in 2 Peter 1, in verse 12, Peter introduces steadfastness and describes it and, and gives it a form that we can hold on to. He's defined this word using the verb form. This is in, in 317, it's a noun, but the verb form of it is in 112. And, and this is what he says. For this reason, 2 Peter 1.12, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are, look at this, there's the word, established. Now, now this is, this is the, the concept. And, and what are we, what is steadfastness? It's being established, look at the end of the verse, in the present truth. What he's, what he's equating is steadfastness is sticking to the word. Steadfastness is living what you say you believe. Steadfastness is, is agreeing that, that God is master of my life. And I will seek first his rule. Remember Matthew, Peter heard all this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else he adds to you. That's, that's the message that Peter embraced. And so he says, verse 12 of chapter 1, you know and you are established. Steadfastness as believers rests upon trusting God's word so much that we obey it on a daily basis, that we experience it daily, that we apply the word to the practical decisions of our life. We actually respond to God. We don't just read the Bible and close it and did that. We leave it open until we... In fact, it reminds me of one of my missionary heroes, um, C.T. Studd, I've talked about him many times. He had two pencils, a blue and a red. I mean, you read his biography, it was so simple. He had his Bible, and every time he found something that God desired or that pleased God or that God commanded, he, he colored it in red. And then he'd stop right there, and he would go through a process of saying, Lord, if that's what you desire, if that's what pleases you, if that's what you command, because you bought me and owned me, and he'd pull out his blue pencil. And when he came to the point of surrendering to what the Lord wanted, put a little blue check by it. You know what a treasure it was for his kids? They lived in Wheaton outside of Chicago, and when dad died, you know, CT died in Africa, they carted home, you know, his, his few belongings and what the kids wanted was that Bible. And they would go through and from cover to cover had all the red and the blue checks. And you know what his devotions became? It became a time where, and that's why marking in his Bible was so important because every time he would flip back and forth, he would see all the things he had underlined and he'd look at them and he'd renew his surrender. He says, oh, I kind of got a little weak there. Lord, I just want to blue check that one again. I love you so much, I forgot that was important to you and it's important to me too. You see, you're established, verse 12 says, in the present truth. Now, now go back to verse 17 of chapter 3, because I want to apply the steadfastness. Our stability, or steadfastness, as believers, rests upon trusting God's word and experiencing application in the practical decisions of life. And the only way to be kept from being led away, look what verse 17 says. It says, beware lest you be that you fall from your steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. See, every day, the world around us is trying to permeate us with, with the direction and philosophy and desires that everybody around us has. Peter's already written, he says, he says, people didn't like you because you wouldn't run with them in the same riot of dissipation. You, you wouldn't do, kind of like the song goes, the things I used to do, don't do them anymore. We used to sing that to, in the youth group when centuries ago when I was a youth pastor. And, and, and it's supposed to be there's a great change in my life. And Peter says there's a great change in your life and you don't do the things you used to do. What happened to the church? It became hated by the world. Why? You want to just be practical? 
in the world. They, they, their jobs, when you went to work, you, would, you were in trade guilds, unions, and the first thing you do in the trade guild is you would bow to the local patron god that blessed your work. Well, everybody in the whole guild of whatever they were, pot makers, would all be bowing, and one of them had their eye open, and they'd see the Christian like this. And the union boss would come and say, what's wrong with you? Bad back? And he'd say, no, good heart. I don't believe in that idol, and I will not bow to it. And they said, well, we'll give you a couple more chances, but you can't be in the union if you don't bow. And there was the choice. Couldn't live in as nice a house if you weren't in the union, the guild, but you couldn't honor God bowing to the idol. And so across the empire, as people became saved, instead of just attending church, having their names on the rolls and saying, yeah, I believe all that, they lived it. Why Christianity swept the empire was not because they had big buildings and programs and mega everything. It's because people at work changed their behavior because they were Christians. And the next thing that happened is the Christians were all sitting there with everybody else and they're watching people getting butchered and their blood flying all over the place. And they, were, they said, oh, didn't I read in Haggai that God doesn't like me looking at bloodshed? So they talked it over, and pretty soon the Bible study group said, you know what, we're not going to the, the Colosseum anymore for, you know, for watching those animals eat the people. This is before the Christians got eaten. I mean, they just started withdrawing. And then they were at the theater. And they didn't have television back then. So every evil that you watch on television, they did live. I mean, they did, they did immorality, real thing, on the stage. And the Christians went, oh, we can't look at that. That would be like dishonoring God. So they started withdrawing from the trade unions. They withdrew from the, the, the ghastly, bloody sports. They withdrew from the... And that's why Paul says, don't even have a hint of immorality. And he says, a hint? The theater is filled with it. We, we won't go to the theater. Then sports. Sports didn't get popular in the 20th century. It's always been popular. The Olympics started back then. And they started going to the sports event, and there went this naked person running by, and they'd already read the Bible. You're not supposed to look at nakedness. And they said, well, wow, they do the sports with no clothes on. We can't come to this now. And that's why they were persecuted. But, but look what it says in verse 17. Beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the air of the wicked. What the people next to him said is, stay, just close your eyes, don't look at that moment. Or, or you know, just bow a little. And, and, and that was the constant threat of just little incremental being led away with the air of the wicked. And so the Lord says, no, be guarding yourself constantly. Be established in the word. And when you read the word, if the word says, don't look at iniquity, don't look at iniquity. If it says, don't bow to false God, don't bow to false God. If it says, don't look at nakedness, don't look at nakedness. And when you start lining up what you say you believe with your everyday life, it's transformational. Can you imagine what would happen in America? I mean, I'm wondering how far the cheerleaders are going to undress before Christians say, I don't want my daughter, I'm not going to be driving her all over the country to learn that, to be uh, one of those. And, and see, it's just, we, we're just, it reminds me of, uh, do you remember in the Pentateuch, removing the ancient landmarks? Moses said, don't move the ancient landmarks. We go, what is that? They used to have stone piles in the corner of their property, and what the, the thrifty farmer would do is at night, he'd look around, he'd move the stone pile just a foot over into his neighbor's, you know, property. Next morning, bright and early, he'd be plowing along and you couldn't even tell. And he'd added an extra foot to his field. And then he'd go out, you know, a little later and he'd move the stone pile on this neighbor's side and he'd plow again. And, and it was that slow, tiny, incremental moving those landmarks and saying, well, it's not as bad. It's not. And, and God says, don't move the ancient landmarks, leave them alone. And when you come up to it, that's the end. Don't go past that. Christianity, we're moving the landmarks all the time because nobody realizes they're even connected to anything. And it's dangerous. So Paul says, don't do that. And you'll fall away. And Peter says, don't be led away by the evil. So 
Look at verse 18, because the solution is not to focus on the error of the wicked, but to focus on the positive side, which is, notice, but grow in grace and in the knowledge. What is grace? It's what God does. What is knowledge? It's what I do. You want a simple understanding of this? I mean, it's, it's children can get it. Grow in grace. That's allowing God to do what only God can do. Grow in knowledge, which is experiencing, actually participating, applying and allowing my obedience to click into what he wants me to do. He says, grow in both departments. But he doesn't just say, grow in spurts. The the verse 18 says, be constantly growing. That's the literal translation of this phrase of verse 18. It's the form that the verb communicates. Today, we need to beware, constantly guarding against anything that hinders our growth because we are wanting to be constantly growing. We don't want anything to hinder our growth. And what's amazing is that These people saw that if they were led away with the error of the wicked, the growth process would stop. And they wanted to grow in appropriating the grace to respond to God and applying it in their life, the experiential knowledge of Christ. And so they responded. And Peter raised their awareness to the constant dangers of the exposure to this materialism-infected world we live in. Living for pleasure, living for stuff, living for experience, living for fun, living for money. You know, remember Jesus, uh, another sermon Peter heard was his other longest sermon in Matthew 24, and it was about the end times. And do you remember Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, the love of many will grow cold Did you know that Jesus applied that to the church? By the time we get to Revelation 3, he talks about the church in Laodicea, and he says that the church became rich and overflowing with stuff and didn't need anything, and there they slowly grew cold and blind and, and in Christ's sight, poor and miserable and blind and naked. So Jesus warned about this. Materialism is a tasteless, colorless, invisible power for evil that surrounds us every day we live, that slowly robs us of our desires for God. And so we need to do a constant check. Now, just to give you an example, Bonnie and I, we faced something very, I mean, we faced a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm going to have to stop telling stories because people are, they're laughing about it. But I'll tell you one more story. I love stories. I think in stories. We, I was at Grace Community Church having a blast. Everywhere I've ever been, I never thought I would leave there. I, I wanted to stay at Bob Jones forever. And then I went to Grace, and I thought I was in heaven. You know, I wanted to stay there forever. And then the elders sent me out, and I went to Rhode Island, and they accompanied me, and John installed me in that church out there. And who wouldn't want to be in, in the Quidnessa Church of Rhode Island? It was a historic church. I mean, it was unbelievable. The DuPont family endowed the church. The pastor, primarily, they built a mansion for the pastor of the church. I lived on a two-acre estate with a home built in the 1800s by the DuPont family, and they funded it with a two shares of DuPont stock, which were worth a million some uh, dollars with all the dividends, and all the proceeds from that, they constantly fixed it up and added to it. It was just like living in a park. It was just beautiful. Those big, wide, old-growth floors, uh, hardwood floors, and the curling, I can still see it. And so Bonnie and I were, you know, just enjoying that immensely, and all of a sudden, I said, honey, you know what? I think we're enjoying this a little too much, you know? Everything taken care of. I mean, there were people that came and went and were fixing and clipping and just doing everything, and everyone had a key to the house. They all worked on it, and it was really interesting, you know? Sometimes we'd be in bed, and we'd hear, yoo we're here, we're doing the drapes, you know, and I said, oh, good, do them, you know, stay downstairs, but um, I said, honey, I think we're enjoying this too much, I said, I think we ought to do a little study about money, and so I went down to the, before the internet, to the Christian bookstore, and there was right on the, in the new book section of the Christian bookstore was Money, Wealth, and Eternity by Randy Elkhorn, it was 520 pages long, complete study of everything the Bible says about money, and I snapped that thing up, and I read it, and it was, it was, arresting. What he said is, he says that, that it's, it's, we're surrounded by materialism so much that we begin to excuse and then we begin to promote materialism. And this, this denial of God for stuff. And, and um, then I was thankful about nine years later, he came out with a layman's, a little tiny one that's about 80 pages long. He distilled the 520 into 80 pages. It's called The Treasure Principle. And so I regularly read that thing and follow his little grid to see whether materialism is 
seeping in, kind of like radon in your basement, you know, whether it's getting in to your family. And so what I'd like to read to you are, I read it again this week, the treasure principle, the short one. And, and I picked out, underlined and picked out 10 what I call life-altering truths to fight materialism. These are just, I counted them, 395 words that Randy Elkhorn wrote. He, I think he's a great guy. By the way, he believes what he teaches. He's an anti-abortionist, so much so that in the 80s and 70s, he would sit in front of the clinics, you know how they'd lay down and grab stuff, you know, and so that they would block the, the gates. And so the U.S. government invoked the racketeering um, laws against Pastor Randy Elkhorn and seized his house, his car, all of his money in the bank, and they said, every wage you make in your salary, we're going to take a percentage of it for the rest of your life. And he says, great, do it. Next day, you know, he's back down holding on at the clinic. And what he did is he just told the church, he says, uh, I'll, if you let me, I'll live in a house that you own and I'll drive a car you own. And all my books, he had sold millions of books. He says, I'm, and he got a lawyer and he rewrote all of his future books and he did new editions and gave them to the Lord and, and he gets no money from it. He just lives on $8 an hour or whatever they pay him at the church. And so, I mean, he really believes this stuff. And so let me read to you what he believes. Number one, this is a simple one. First life-altering tooth. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead. Wow. If we really believe that, if we really believe that, that we can't take any of this stuff to heaven, we would be strategizing how to send the maximum amount ahead instead of not. Number two, this is a great statement. The grace that has freed us from bondage to sin is desperately needed to free, to free us from the bondage, from our bondage to materialism. Do we really think that? Number three, God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. Wow, that kind of sounds like a when I used to be in the Southern Baptist Church in Georgia, it sounds like a slogan for a campaign of giving for a building or something. But that's actually what the Bible says. That God gives us these things to reflect his ownership of our lives. I always remember John MacArthur when I was on staff there. He said that the elders kept raising his pay to see if he'd be a good steward and give it back to the Lord. Isn't that interesting to think about? Not to raise your standard of living. Number four, God doesn't look at what we give, not only at what we give, he also looks at what we keep. God judges what we give by what we keep. Remember what the giver Jesus honored? The widow who out of her poverty gave, gave so little, but proportionately it was everything? That's what the Lord notices. Number five, Alcorn says, I've heard people say, I want to have a heart for missions. And I always respond, Jesus tells you exactly how to get it. Put your money in missions. Put your money in the church and with the poor, and your heart will follow. Did you know that the purpose of the church is not to be begging and putting advertising and saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, get involved, get involved, get involved. The people who are invested here are involved here. And the people who aren't, you can't drag them in because they don't have an investment. Because Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart follows the treasure. And so that shows who the master is. Number six, when Jesus warns us not to store up treasures on earth, it's not because wealth might be lost. It's because wealth will always be lost. Either it leaves us while we live, or we leave it when we die. No exceptions. Realizing its value is temporary should radically affect our investment strategy. And then I love this. According to Jesus... Storing up earthly treasures isn't simply wrong. It's just plain stupid. Now, do we really believe that? Does that show? Number seven, it's increasingly common for Christians to ask one another those tough questions. How is your marriage? Have you been spending time in the Word? How are you doing in terms of sexual purity? Have you been sharing your faith? But how often do we ask how much are you giving to the Lord? Or, have you been robbing God? Or, are you winning the battle against materialism? Reminds me of uh, the first pastor sent out from Grace Church. His name was Daryl Delhousay, a good friend of mine. He was a junior high pastor, and he told John, I want a pastor. And John said, okay, we'll send you to this needy place in Phoenix, Arizona called Scottsdale. 
And so he went to Scottsdale with this little group of a couple hundred people that were struggling and, and had had all kinds of problems. And Daryl ministered the word, systematically, expositionally taught, and he comes back a few years later and gets the plans to the Auditorium of Grace, and he rebuilds the the 3,500-seat auditorium that he came from at Grace, and the church swelled to several thousand. I mean, at least when I went there last, it was six or 7,000 attending. Well, because of that, there was a commensurate swelling of, of their honoring of him, and in Scottsdale, you live, according to how wealthy you are, is how far up the mountain, you know, Shadow Mountain and all these other mountains there, and so Camelback, and so the, the further up the mountain means you're wealthier because you can see more of the lights, you know, in the desert and the sunrise. And so Daryl had gotten two-thirds of the way up the mountain. He kept, you know, you flip houses and they're going up and you buy a new one, you invest because it's your great savings, whatever it used to be. And he's two-thirds of the way up and he's preaching through this stuff. And he talks to Holly and he says, you know what, honey? I figured that if we sell our house, we could free and clear own a house down in the flatlands and the 2,500 or 27, whatever it was, a month mortgage payment, we could outright support our own missionary for the rest of our life. And so Holly said, great idea. And they sold their house just like that, moved down to the flatland, told no one in the church. And the next Christmas, everyone came up to bring their presents, knocked on the door, and they weren't there. And they said, what? And they said, well, they moved down there. And, and people started mobbing their house. They said, what happened? Why did you move down here? And he slowly, one by one, told the church, and you know what happened? People started selling their houses and moving down to the flatlands. And their mission trips started having 500 people at a time going on short-term missions. Everybody wanted a part of, of it. Very, very interesting. Number eight, many Christians dread the thought of leaving this world. Why? Because so many have stored up their treasures here on earth, not in heaven. Each day then brings us closer to death. If your treasure's on earth, each day brings you closer to losing everything. And that isn't good. Number nine, he who lays up treasures on earth spends his life backing away from his treasures. To him, death is loss. He who lays up treasure in heaven looks forward to eternity. He's moving daily toward his treasures. To him, death is gain. Sounds like a verse, right? That Paul wrote. Wow. He who spends his life moving toward his treasures has reason to rejoice. Question, are you despairing? because you're getting further away and you can't spend it fast enough and you have limited strength to, or are you rejoicing because you're getting closer to your treasures? And now the last one, and then it's time for communion. When you leave this world, here's a great question. Will you be known by God who really knows you and the friends that really knew you as one who accumulated treasures on earth that you couldn't keep? Or will you be recognized as one who invested treasures in heaven that you couldn't lose. Remember, Peter heard Jesus ask, who are you living for on earth? Are you living for me? Does your time, your treasure, your, your habits, your, your devotion, does it point that way or this way? That's a good question to ponder as we get ready for communion. So let's all just bow our heads right now before the Lord, and I'm going to pray. And the elders and deacons are going to get up to prepare uh, to serve us. But with your head bowed and eyes closed, just ask yourself, if you died on the way home today, would you be known as someone who accumulated treasures on earth probably you can't even pay for, or someone who invested treasures in heaven? What direction is your life going? Because did you know you'll never be in the future what you don't start being today? And communion is when we say, Lord, you're my master. You get first place of my time. You get first place of my schedule. You get first place. I want you to direct my career, not, not the world. I want you to be the owner of all that I have. Communion is where we say, Lord, you bought me at a price, and I want to glorify you. And Father, thank you for letting us gather around this table. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that though it's the elders and deacons passing the elements, it's actually you. Just like on that first Lord's Supper, as you looked into the eyes of those disciples and you said, this is my body, 
I'm actually giving my body to purchase you. This is my blood. I'm pouring out my life because I love you so much. And all I want in return is for you to know that you were bought at a price and therefore do what glorifies me because you love me. And Lord, I pray at this communion, that's what we would do. And as we talk about you who died for us, and at your name, our knee is going to bow in heaven. May our knee bow in the schedule and choices we make on earth. And may we not only enthrone you in our hearts, but may we enthrone you in the little decisions we make every day of what's going to get our attention. And we'll thank you for this bread and the reminder you bring. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen.